Hi, I'm Rob Stewart in Vermont. We're here in the cold of winter. Some of America's sweetest farms are making maple syrup for those warm pancakes on your table. We'll take you sugar making in New England. Hi, I'm Sarah Gardner. We're heading to a famous farm in central Ohio that's long been an experiment in sustainability. Malabar Farm has also been a site that's welcomed many of Hollywood's biggest stars. I'm John Lobertini. You've all heard about cattle drives, but what about driving a herd of 4,000 sheep to the high desert for summer pasture? Well, here in Arizona, it is a yearly trip one family has been making for generations. That's coming up next on America's Heartland. You can see Close to the land. Is breakfast your favorite meal? Well, it is for a lot of people when it's pancakes and delicious maple syrup. So how do you get that great maple flavor? Well, it begins far away from the breakfast table. It's a late winter ritual older than America itself. As these snow-covered New England mountains begin to thaw. Ah, oh, man, nice and full. The farmstead hills and valleys of Vermont come alive with the annual sound of maple syrup being made. That sound there is music to a sugar maker's ear, that drip, drip, drip. Arnold Coombs' family has been sugar making, as they call it, for seven generations. Today, he's tapping a tree that was planted decades before the Declaration of Independence. Well, this is the method that's been used for um, well over 100 years, where you drill a hole into the tree, it's a little bit bigger hole than the plastic one, drive a metal spout into the tree, and just hang a bucket on it with a cover. This sugar house is where Arnold's cousins boil the sap down into maple syrup. It's a slow process as water in the sap evaporates over a wood-burning fire. As outside temperatures warm, maple sap will flow for several weeks. It takes about 10 gallons of sap to make just one quart of syrup. How long did this take to fill up? On a, on a perfect day, you can fill it in, in one day. That's four gallons of sap. So four that, gallons. Four okay. gallons, so that would be 40% of your crop in one day. Just across the Vermont border in New Hampshire, syrup runs in the family for Bruce Bascom as well. My great-grandfather moved uh, to part of this property in 1853. Uh, he was tapping maybe uh, 500 trees, probably in wooden buckets. But times have changed, and maple means money. Bascom Maple Farms is one of the biggest producers of maple syrup in the world they take a more modern approach. Everywhere you look, there is a sea of taps and tubes. Today, they're filled with flowing sap. You see the bubbles? Oh moving? yeah. And what it does is you usually have about half a dozen of these hooked together into a larger pipe. See, see, the sap's flowing right now. Bruce has 2,400 acres, 63,000 trees, woven together by a plastic tubing system that makes Maple Mountain farming high tech. And you can see with the, with the newer technology with the plastic tubing, you, could, you can consolidate it all into one, one spot so one person can, uh, can actually uh, obtain sap from trees that are in remote hillsides that, like there, you'd never gather buckets with a pail. On an acre of land, usually you only make about 25 total gallons over a six week period. Wow. It takes a lot, of, uh, a lot of area to make much production. Right across from the crop, Bruce can boil 4,000 gallons of sap an hour. Bottle after bottle, barrel after barrel, and box after box is filled with syrup and shipped for sale worldwide. The push for this product is on. What's happened is the demand in uh, Asia, like Japan, Korea, China, um, all through Europe, demand in the United States is, is way up. And so there's 
It's a specialty crop that they can't make in the other countries. The sweet success has us in the mood for some tastings. This is my official mm. grading. Man, that is delicious. Bruce grades each barrel with this device he calls his color comparator. But Bruce can even walk into a room and smell the grade of syrup. I imagine you've had quite a few sugar highs. <laughs> well, you can taste uh, yeah, you can taste several hundred barrels in a day, but uh, you don't want to break for lunch. Uh, it works good to sit down after about uh, 50 minutes, have a glass of water, have a, have a pickle, something that's sour. But it all began with a tree, something Arnold Coombs never forgets. As a sugar maker, do you feel a connection with these trees? Oh, I do. Especially, there's an older tree out back, and every time I tap it, it's, I just kind of give it a pat, you know, and every time I gather, it's like, yeah, thank you. And, <laughs> uh, you know, they're giving up some sap for us, so I do appreciate that. Although maple trees grow in Europe, Europeans were unaware of the potential uses of the sweet sap until colonists learned how to tap the trees from Native Americans. When Britain imposed heavy taxes on sugar, the maple sweetener became even more popular. Now, if I say ranching, it probably brings to mind cattle, but ranchers in the heartland these days do more than raise beef on the hoof. In fact, if you go to the open spaces of eastern Arizona, we're talking sheep, some of whom make a very long walk to take a summer vacation. Ho, ho, ho! Driving sheep from the desert floor to the mountains of Arizona is a yearly ritual for Dwayne Dobson and his family. The 220 mile journey will take months along the rough and winding Haberino Sheep Trail. I'm third generation in this uh, business. My granddad bought the outfit in 1929. Dwayne Dobson knows a lot about raising sheep and he carries on the family legacy with an unflinching devotion. Like I say, it's tradition for uh, well, all, all of Arizona. These, these driveways were established in the 1880s, before Arizona was even a state. Twice a year, the Dobson clan moves 4,000 sheep to and from the higher elevations. The cooler temperatures are more favorable to the stock, and summering in the mountains provides access to better grazing land. Arizona sheep ranchers raise more than 150,000 animals each year a small segment of the more than six million plus sheep on ranches across the country. Good morning. How are you doing? Mark Bradford took over the job for his father-in-law 15 years ago. Yeah, it's a unique well, equation that we were able to spend that time transferring from the lower elevations up to the higher elevations and we actually follow kind of our the, the temperature climate up the hill. It's more like staying a step ahead of the heat. Now these sheep will travel anywhere from six to 10 miles a day, and in some cases they will do it over very rugged terrain. But they will take every bit of 45 days to make this pilgrimage to higher ground. Used to be more than a dozen ranchers guided their sheep into the mountains for mating season. But the Dobsons are the last of a dying breed, and word is spreading. Oh, look at that. So on this late April morning, crowds gathered east of Mesa to watch the flock cross the Salt River at the Blue Point Bridge. Okay, we're on the road. It's a carefully choreographed move. Mark, Dwayne, and their crew bring half the herd down to a staging area, wait overnight, then race them across the bridge at sunrise. It's a fading glimpse of ranching history. Jan Stasiak has been waiting for two days. Oh, I'm very excited. Kent Miller and his grandson are playing hooky from school. I didn't want to not experience it. It was like a historic, historic event for me, so and I want to take my grandson and him to experience it. The flock moves carefully across the asphalt, then kicks it into high gear with the surge of a much bigger herd. The sheep almost instinctively know the way. Well, how's it going? Wonderful, so far. It could change in a heartbeat, though. On this day, everything goes just as planned cross the bridge, make a sharp left, and a cloud of dust. It's a spectacle seen few other places in modern America, and one that leaves a lasting impression. It was uh, very interesting that the sheep knew their way, where they were going. The leaders came right down and knew right where they were going to come through the gate. Retired school teacher Cindy Shanks has been following the Dobson sheep for 10 months. 1,500 photographs later, Shanks says she wants to write a book titled the Great Arizona Sheep Drive. It's history, and Arizona kids don't have a lot of history because we're such a young state, 
And this is, this is important history. Some of this land is a short drive from urban areas and development is slowly choking off access to these coveted trails. We were able to actually graze our sheep at different, different ranchers uh, farm ground all the way to where we got to our own property. Now you cross about 15 Home Depots, some Lowell's, and grocery stores. How long these annual treks can go on will depend on forces outside the plot. Encroaching civilization and redefined land use may shut down these pathways to the past. But Dwayne Dobson says, for now, the migrations will continue. The way the economics are, we're the only ones left. Oh, I don't intend to quit here unless the pressure just gets too great. There are more breeds of sheep than any other livestock species, more than a thousand worldwide. Their woolly coats are categorized by fiber length and thickness. So some sheep are great for soft sweaters, some for your winter overcoat, and some for that carpet on your living room floor. Hi, I'm Jason Schultz. Coming up, I'll tell you how a farm and feed store is being preserved after being in the same family for 150 years. Hi, I'm Sarah Gardner. Still ahead, you might not believe that Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall would have ever been interested in a farm stay visit, but we're going to take you to the Ohio farm where the couple was married and spent their honeymoon. Hi, I'm Paul Robbins, and here's something you may not have known about agriculture. Apples are one of the most popular fruits around today. They have vitamin C, they help reduce cholesterol, they're low in calories. So who do we have to thank for what the French call le pomme? Well, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. Apples may have first been harvested in Asia, but it was the Romans who began major cultivation, and by 23 AD, Roman farmers were growing more than 30 varieties of apples. Fast forward 1,600 years, and colonists in the New World were growing apples big time. In fact, in 1635, one farmer in Connecticut was producing 31,000 gallons of apple cider a year, and that will quench your thirst. Today, the U.S. is one of the major apple-producing nations in the world, with the majority of the Red Globes coming from Washington, Michigan, and New York. Two tidbits on apple lore. Uh, we know the rhyme as an apple a day keeps the doctor away. But linguists tell us the original quote was, eat an apple on going to bed and you'll keep the doctor from earning his bread. And while apples are mentioned in the Bible, some historians say it wasn't an apple, but a quince or a pomegranate that got Adam and Eve tossed from the Garden of Eden. If you like apples, there are more than 7,000 varieties. That's something to sink your teeth into. Oregon's Union Mills Feed Mill got its start grinding grain with a water wheel. It has lots of history and it's been in the same family for generations. And today, as that family faces new challenges, they're finding new opportunities. Downtime is hard to come by at the Union Mills Feed Store in Milano, Oregon. It's been that way for five generations. Today, it's out there today getting unloaded. You know, we've been in business for 130 years, and not many companies can say they've been in business, especially the same family, the same area, doing pretty much the same thing we've been doing all these years. And at the center of the activity is Bob Frederick. This is, this is the old homestead, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, I've been here since uh, I was two, which about four, 1942 is when uh, my folks moved here. 1942. Yeah. It was Bob's great-great-grandparents whose trip on the Oregon Trail brought them to this property in 1848. From sawmill, feed store, to family farm, this operation has changed with the times. Yeah. Chickens Chickens, there, yeah. I see. And yeah, wife and I both like chickens. Yeah. And some, there's some guineas in there. Got some peacocks in the other one. Ducks in the next pan. You know, just a little bit of everything. So it must be pretty humbling to be here how many years later after you know your ancestors built this farm to still have it going, to still have oh, yeah. the livestock. It's, it's, and... it's nice. I, you know, I, always, I always think about it you know, once in a while about, gee, wonder what it was like back in the 1850s so when they got here and cleared this ground. In 1877, a flour mill was built. It was converted to a livestock feed mill in the 1930s. 
Today, Bob's daughter, Connie, is the mill's general manager, and Connie's husband does construction projects. And the nice thing is that we don't have to have two bags five deep. His daughter, Heather, spends her weekends working at the mill and farm and is planning to return full time to the mill soon. I think that we're born with that, that passion, you know, of you know, our, our ancestors. We have the work ethic. I know it was born into us. You know, we were raised working. We were raised um, to be very supportive and faithful to the family. I don't know how old we were at that age. As Bob's generation has a smaller role in the day-to-day -day operation, there's more talk now of handing off to the next generation. And, and even my kids who are young enough, they come down here and help after school sometimes. They'll help on the weekends. Uh, when we have events going on, they'll come and help do whatever they can. Maybe, you know, someday eventually take over the business. Like many agricultural endeavors, the Fredericks face land value pressures, growth challenges, and changing demands at their store. They adapt to meet new consumer demands. Two of their biggest areas now are horse care products and pet food. What's the lesson you're, you're trying to share, you're going to pass on to the next generation when they take this thing over? What are you going to tell them in terms of managing something like this? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, every, I know one thing, you never make a lot of money. Your money's invested in what you have. But you get a satisfaction. I don't know what it is. It's just a satisfa satisfaction that's down in here somewhere that says, look what I've done. I've kept this going another generation. Family land and the house and the business are that's our life. That's our life. And I we mean, will stay. We will never sell our property. You would have to come and get it. Yeah. Dad, is that you behind? Yes, it is. Say cheese. Many early farmers who arrived in Oregon came west on the Oregon Trail, the longest of the overland routes used in America's westward expansion. By the way, many states have official state trees or flowers. Well, Oregon also has an official state nut. It's the hazelnut. I'm Randy Oliver. I'm a small commercial beekeeper. By small meaning, I run about 500 colonies, which is kind of the minimum that you can make a living off of honeybees with. The larger commercial beekeepers run tens of thousands of colonies. What I'm doing right here is lighting the smoker. The value of bees, I can tell you for the United States, the most recent study, which was some years ago, uh, calculated that if honeybees were to immediately disappear, we'd lose about $20 billion worth of agricultural production a year. $20 billion with a bee. You can taste the honey at any time. Just reach in, get that honey. Mm. About a third of all the food you put on your table uh, comes from bee pollinated crops. We wouldn't starve, we'd still have food, but the, the food on your plate would be pretty bland. You'd have the grains, you'd have wheat, you'd have rice, you'd have corn, you'd have potatoes but you wouldn't have the green vegetables, you wouldn't have the bright colored fruits. Essentially, the things that are good for you on the plate are the things that bees pollinate. So there's the queen bee right there. She's the mother of every bee inside this hive right here. But the good thing about all this is that it brought to the public's attention the connection between nature and your food supply. You can go to bees like this, if you move slowly here, you can just scoop up a whole handful of bees. They call beekeeping the gentle art. Beekeeping is something that the suburbanite, or the, the hobbyists can get into and actually get into a small scale agriculture on their own. If you bring a beehive into your yard in suburbia, all your neighbors benefit. All of a sudden, all their fruit trees start to produce better in their gardens. They can, produce, they can grow cucumbers and squashes and melons, things they might not have been able to grow before because there wasn't enough, weren't enough pollinators in the neighborhood. There's nothing better than beekeeping, especially as a migratory beekeeper, which is what I am, because you follow the spring. You move your bees to where it's beautiful, so every day when you go out to work, you're working in the most beautiful places there are. It's just like there's nothing like the energy of being in a bee yard in the springtime, and the vitality of those bees is, is contagious, and you just you feel it throughout your body. The history of American farming has dramatically affected not only our lifestyles, but that of people around the world. And it's a history that's involved some famous people in famous places. Take, for example, this farm in Ohio. 
Louis Bromfield's Malabar Farm is a living memorial to a man whose vision made him an early supporter of agricultural practices that have become commonplace today. The Ohio-born Bromfield would become a Pulitzer Prize-winning author of 30 bestsellers. But it was to study agriculture that took him to Cornell University in 1914. He left college to fight in World War I, returned to become a reporter, turned out an award-winning novel, Early Autumn, and used his prize money to buy this farmland near Lucas, Ohio in 1938. Uh, he wanted to come back home and he, he set out to buy four what were called rundown farms uh, to build what he uh, wanted to name Malabar Farm. Bromfield set out to revitalize the farms, taking the Malabar name from a setting in one of his novels. He saw these 1900 acres as someplace special. The farm was an experimental farm of new ways of utilizing the, the equipment and utilizing the ground, contour plowing, um, basically using a, a lot of the green manures, um, use of no-till equipment. Bromfield's innovations paved the way for sustainable farming. Bromfield's literary work generated friends in the arts. His books became major motion pictures, and Hollywood made its way to the farm. Folks from uh, James Cagney, uh, Gracie Allen, people like that came here. Bromfield would uh, assign them a job task to do, whether it was going into the chicken house and gathering eggs. Uh, nobody was immune from work, and if they did not want to uh, partake in the chore, uh, Bromfield would send for a cab and ship them to a hotel in Mansfield. There's another tie to Hollywood. In 1945, Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall decided to get married at Malabar Farm. Humphrey Bogart was a longtime friend of Louis Bromfield, and they had met in the 1920s and remained friends their whole lives. But when Humphrey Bogart needed a little out-of-the-way place to get married, uh, he called his friend Bromfield. He had been out here. He knew what a great place this was and how far away from everything it was. So this was the perfect spot. They did arrive the day before the wedding and had the wedding in the front hallway of the big house. After Bromfield's death in 1956, the farm went through some tough economic times. The state of Ohio assumed ownership in 1972. Today, Malabar is, once again, a working farm, welcoming visitors who want to know more about crops and livestock. We have a cow-calf operation. We have pigs, chickens, goats, sheep, draft horses, ponies. And when it comes to, uh, for instance, the crops that you grow, the cattle you raise, the pig, the pork that you raise, um, tell me about where all of this goes. We produce a quality beef or pork item, and it's sold to our restaurant that is located inside Malabar Farm State Park. We sell retail cuts through our gift shop here at the farm. We try to give a, the park visitor or the tourist a total farm experience. Bromfield's legacy is also a draw. The farm teaches visitors about his sustainable approach to agriculture. Oh, what a pretty, pretty spot. And also has tours of the 32-room country home where Bromfield and his wife threw lavish parties for farm folks and celebrities alike. There are over 4,000 books in the house. Uh, a lot of these books were given to Bromfield by the authors who wrote them. Some have inscriptions inside. The chance to tell visitors the Bromfield story makes Malabar Farm unique as a state park and tourist attraction. It's a blend of agritourism, literary history, and working agriculture. It causes us uh, to wear multiple hats. Uh, we are uh, a state park system. We're one, one of the Ohio state parks. Uh, there's 74 state parks in the system, uh, but we're the only state park that is a working farm. That's going to do it for now. Thanks for traveling the country with us on America's Heartland. And we're always pleased that you can join us. Remember, there's much more on America's Heartland on our website, including video from today's show. Just log on to americasheartland.org. We will see you next time right here on America's Heartland. To order a copy of this broadcast, visit us online or call 1-888-814-3923. The cost is $14.95 plus shipping.